Our next guest is acclaimed property developer Terry Agnew, founder of Tower Holdings. Terry, it's a pleasure having you as a guest on the program. Take us through your background in terms of where you grew up and some of your early childhood memories. We come from a family of Catholics, uh, f father and mother and three kids. We grew up in Annandale in Sydney, which was a unfashionable in a city area in those days. A lot of love and uh, care and sport in our, f in our family. Uh, Dad w was working class. Uh, he'd come back from World War II and neither of them had any money. He would, in those days, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a bad spot to grow up as young kids, you know, I, and uh, they moved me out at 11, but it was, it was also um, a lot of um, nastier kids when they got older into all sorts of trouble. So a few, few of mine blokes I grew up with had a few years to, holidays. So um, it, it, was, it was, you know, it was good. So we, we, we moved off and, and we went to primary, primary schools around there at a Catholic college. And uh, then we moved over to where in Sydney is, uh, uh, not far from there is a new little suburb in those days was Dremoyne. From that, we, we, my brother and I, my older brother and I um, were sent off to secondary school at, um, at Christian Brothers at Lewisham. And talk to us about Terry Agnew as a student. Where did you attend school? And, and once you completed your high school studies, did you go on to university? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we, 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 as I just said, we, we, uh, I, I went to um, Christian Brothers at Lewisham. It wasn't top, school, top level of private schools, but it cost mum and dad some money. Um, and we had all had terrific uh, results. Um, to get into university. So um, in terms of property, I did a, 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 there was no property degrees around in those days. So, and I wasn't even thinking of it, but I was already thinking of getting into business. So I, we did a bachelor, I did a Bachelor of Commerce at the Uni of New South Wales and, uh, and loved it, you know, as against high school, really, really loved it and ma majored in marketing had a year at Esso, biggest company in the world, and, and got out and, and quit. <laughs> Thinking, I'm never going to get anywhere here. There's about 500,000 above me all around in 52 countries. So, you know, uh, and your, your parents just love it when they hear that, um, you know, working class parents that you've got and quit your first job, you know, and you've got nothing. We went on from there, yeah. What attracted you to business? Yeah, I don't know. You know, like we we, we were, as I said, we were, we had a lot of lot of sport within our family and and beaches. So when I was seventeen, we'd go up. And the boys would go for up up the coast, and uh, they they re re always remind me. That one day they caught me at seventeen reading the financial <laughs> review on the beach in between waves. You know, like <laughs> what's going on here? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, I was just had that grab. I was gravity grabbed me and 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 shoved me into to, into something like that. And particularly with I and and it was interesting because with the degree, I should have had a walk into advertising because that's because it was the Yank Star. This all the the uh, the, the books on marketing and our dodos in 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 in. in uh, in uh, in the in the in, in that, that sort of field, no one was educated. So, and ditto for uh, the people in real estate, and and that's and and through that degree and marketing, I got my my first job in property, which was I know is going to be your next question. Like, how, what drew me to it? No, it wasn't property. It's they, um, my brother knew one of the partners of Jones Lang LaSalle in those days. And uh, he was a really, he was in charge of leasing in Sydney and they wanted to do some research on the CBD of, of Sydney as to wh what sections have what type of industry. So, uh, so we, anyway, I got the gig because I also did market research. So I did four months of it and it was like it was before CityScope came out in Melbourne and Sydney. So I did that for four months and, and beside me, blokes are making commissions. <laughs> I want to get in there. And I was 23, you know. So, and it was one of the biggest firms in the world. So it was, and all British guys, 
run it, you know, and they loved it coming out because they had their equivalent of a property degree, ARICS or something they called themselves. Um, so yeah, so I finished that and, and after four months I said, can I get into the leasing? And he said, yes, we'll, we'll give you a shot. And, you know, when I first, you know, saw my, my name in the paper, I thought I was off. And the first deal, I said, this is, can't, doesn't get any better than this, <laughs> you know. So from real estate sales, how then did you get into property development? It was a natural um, progression. So I, I left them after the, I was doing leasing for about three years and went to LJ Hooker and, be, and became manager of the city sales department. And Sydney's a great spot under the old laws of supply and demand in economics. It's just an island. It's like New York, I, I, I often say it. And it's so you've got Sydney Harbour, you've got the Hyde, Hyde Park on the one side, Sydney Harbour, you've got the railway at the other end, and then you've got what we've got in the back here, you know, Darling Harbour. So it's so when I was the, the, the boss of city sales at, at 26 years of age, I said to him, we're going to do it this way. You know, you're going to give you sections and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we pretty well knew we'd come in Sunday mornings and go and do four, four blocks as to who was in each building and who owns it. So when I left and, and, and it's got, got some money from um, uh, various small deals I was doing on the side, um, I pretty well knew every building in the city and every owner and ten the tenants that were in it. So I had perfect information to be a trader, you know, and, and the market was just coming out of a blur that it, that it, um, you know, when I first, when I started with Jones Lang, you know, four, four, four years before, they were sacking people left, right and centre. And then the things had just come good. And when I left Tookers and, and I, I knew, you know, I knew buildings that, you know, the, the guy thought it was worth 10 million. Uh, the agents were telling that it's six or seven but that I'd say, I, but I'd say, you know, I know that building. It's actually worth twelve. So I'd say to the agents, "Hey, listen, go in, on, go and see Mr. So and So at Fifty Six Pit, and make him an offer." So <laughs> make him an offer he can't refuse. So that's how I got. I, you know, I was luck. It was, it was not no luck. It was just, you know, perfect position to to kickstart a business, without playing developer, um, but to just get them and undervalued because I had perfect knowledge and also, I also knew what was going on with the leasing market. So as long as they stuck to that one patch, which is the richest pack of, of part of Australia, you know, I knew everyone from AMPs, uh, National Mutuals. Um, it was, it was a, a really terrific time to start, a, start a, a business. And once you did start your property development career, what were some of the early projects you worked on and what were they and where were they located? I went out when I was 30, 31, and those first 10 years, I didn't build anything. Um, uh, probably a couple of small blocks of flats or something. But, you know, I bought and sold. You know, I was a trader and, and, and still am today. So, so I, would, I would be buying... Uh, we called ourselves Kent Street Developments and we, we bought along Kent Street probably 15, 20 buildings from four storeys to 10 storeys. It was a heritage section of the city before it is now and then it overlooks Darling Harbour now. So I'd take them and, and, and probably, you know, as, as I says, says you, know, you know, I'd buy them, fix them, sell them and we would have done that just in that southern section, which I knew backwards probably 20, 30 times. Um, and then we were moving up, up into the mainstream, uh, into the bigger properties, more around the 40, 50 million plus. How long have you been developing for now and have you seen the Sydney market change over time or indeed other markets that you've <clears throat> developed in? There were no funds in those days. There were real estate companies, so Stocklands, uh, Lend Lease, Mervac were the survivors. A lot of them didn't come through. So that's they were the ones on the stock market. Um, there were very few blokes like myself, like very few. Um, what you would have though is 
um, from World War II, the, the, the Jewish guys came in and were in the rag trade. So they would, then they'd be doing very well. So they'd say, well, let, let's just, let's buy 55 King Street because we occupied half of it. So they owned quite a section of it as well. Um, your insurance companies, as I said, and then you had um, uh, the English public companies from Hammersons who did um, the shopping centre at um, Brookvale um, and a couple of other things. They brought knowledge which our development groups really weren't that good at, you know. So, and, and, they, and, they, and they worked with Jones Lang because the English guys who ran Jones Lang knew them back in, in, uh, in London. So um, we had a bit of Chinese competition, but it was not a lot to, to you know, I'd be in this, it, I was fighting with institutions for every property I bought within two or three years, you know. So it was a, 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 a really simple time to start it. The banks, there were a lot more banks than there is today. You know, we, I reckon there would have been at least 10. And then they had, so I'd be borrowing on, you know, say at an income producing property, 70%. I could get mezzanine from the banks, what they call their finance mobs, um, groups, and um, custom credit, for instance. And they'd offer you another 15%. So I'd, you'd get your 15% to, to renovate the place, fix it up, and then rent it up, sit on it for as long as you like, or sell it. Take us through the, the Tower Holdings business today. Who's involved and, and what sort of projects are you pursuing or have pursued over the past, say, five to 10 years? The five to 10 year period brings in Nine Castle Ray and, um, and uh, North Point, and then before that, O'Connell Street, we, we did a, a, a mortgagee possession um, property deal there. So, so I've moved uptown and been there for a while. It was a tough time and we'd sold something, I can't remember what. We had 30 or 40 million around and uh, there was a mortgagee sale in O'Connell Street going through to Bly, which we bought for 52 million. We sold the one on the corner to Gary Roffel is it still around, it's just done a big development in North Sydney. And then I kept the rest of it, which was going to be a site. And we sold that to Bankers Trust for 52 million, uh, which is what I say. So, and we sold the other one for 25. So we had a lot of cash. And then Nine Castle Ray came up. So um, that was approximately 10 years ago. And I thought it was one of the best buildings in town. Harry Seidler designed it. Uh, it was the most expensive building per square metre in Australia at that stage. It was only about 15 years old. Um, so two of these guys had brought it to me. Chad LeGrew was one of them. Um, we settled. But they, they had to, you know, they, for, for different reasons, didn't have the cash to go on with it. So um, I paid them out and, you know, immediately worked to get it, you know, with, with Harry. Um, it was an interesting bloke and filled it up and then was ready to move. And then we, we did the deal with, with um, Stocklands on North Point. So that was at the end of that. So it's, um, it was, yeah, there was, it was a, a, a good period um, leading up to the um, GFC. Just on those deals and whether you're looking at, at development sites today or commercial assets, what are the fundamentals you consider when looking at a new acquisition? First of all, you know, basically, you know, I, I've stuck to um, up till a couple of years, only a few years ago, uh, to commercial and um, to re uh, um, uh, residential. So um, it's pretty simple, you know. I mean, there's, I mean, we went up to Brisbane and uh, in 2001 and set up an office up there and it was quite evident that, that the, uh, that there's only two large co corporations to compete with, and that was um, Mervac and Lendlease. We went in and built um, two high rises and three, bought three other sites, did made terrific mo uh, uh, money out of it, and then then there was the the the, the, the um, a whole bunch of people came within came in back into the CBD market. 
So, so I, I look at, I look at areas, you know, if it's if it's a DA, whether it's land or whether it's a building, as as to where they are in the cycles, is there, you know, and I like to get in first, um, and and with a view to get out at around about, you know, um, thirty percent, halfway through the the clock, you know, and so that particularly when because the problem is. When I first started, I could get a DA for 20, 30 stories in three months with Sydney uh, uh, Council and with Brisbane. Um, today, that would be two to three years. So the market can change for that. Then you've got to rent, the, rent, the rent it. So um, really difficult. So, you know, so <laughs> really difficult. And so, you've, you've, um, you know, I, I, I mean, we, those days were good. Today, you couldn't... You, you, even the you know the the guys that you know the bigger guys who've just done stuff in the city and and what you're seeing now, pretty well every one of those have got a pre-lease. You know, so so when I look at them, I think obviously what can I do? You know, is is, is and I try to be about 18 months ahead of the marketplace. And in most case, in, in commercial, I, there's a few of us that normally are in that same bracket. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's been very, very, um, you know, uh, it, it, we've had good results. And which sectors of the market <coughs> or, or which areas, which pockets of the market are offering the greatest opportunity at the moment? I know you've got some projects underway in Byron Bay, I think. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. We went up to Byron Bay as a family and, and bought a site and built a house about, I call it about nine, eight, eight, nine years ago uh, in the, in the uh, GFC. So I started... So I was up there, you know, and it was, you know, not much had happened over 20 years of surfing it when I used to go there as a kid, you know, and it was like, it's what the hippies had moved, it was getting a little bit expensive for the hippies. They'd moved out, out in, inland. A couple of few of them, uh, Hare Krishna still walking around. <coughs> and I thought this, and I'd already, I'd had a house on the waterways at um, Isla Capri in surfers and, the kids wanted to learn to surf, and I said, "Well, you, you're not going to learn out there because you'll drown out, out there at Surfers Paradise. It's not a Surfers Paradise." So we went down for a day to um, Byron and and took them around, took them all, and we had um, great fun at Wadigos. Uh, within three months, I bought in Wadigos to to re, 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 redevelop. So that got me in, and of course, next minute I'm talking to agents. I always do, and. I thought this is this is the best surfing spot in Australia, and if you're into that, but it's also got the hinterland. So I thought this 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 is cheap. It just it's the whole price pricing from what it goes, which is only 50 houses, to you know the, the stuff along the front there, um, the main beach. You know, it was way too cheap, way too cheap. And I just thought, this this will, this will have a run. Now, I, I, no one could have seen how good it was. So so while I'm sitting around there and, and the next minute, um, and we're still at the tail end of the GFC and we're building, and we've got Hutchison to build this terrific house and got the American um, architects from who, who helped me out on uh, Great Kebble and they done, did this amazing... Um, uh, a house for us. So I thought suddenly, the, um, you know, a, a, a mortgage in possession site came out, which we bought for for nothing. And then the, the guy had been, and then it's just on the fringe of town um, at the other end from from um, uh, where most of the, the, the world, oh, well, it's, it's in, it's right opposite the industrial centre. So we had a go at it and we bought it um, really well, really cheaply. Um, because it was still rose, uh, um, um, uh, rural, you know, and the guy before it had had a 14 years, and that's because you are in the, the green, probably the greenest council in Australia. They were never going to rezone it, but so the New South Wales government took it out of their hands, and and I thought, well, this is, and Prue Goward was the mem the member, the minister for um, planning. I thought there was a chance that. It might come through, and six months later it did, for um, to residential, and it was about 200 acres, 
right there, right on the edge of town, two kilometres, you know. So, I mean, you multiply, if you get lucky, like you multiply, whatever you pay for it, multiply by 10 to 20. Uh, and then right beside it, um, which just, it's just coincidentally, there's, I could tell as well, looking at the industrial, there's, there was a shortage of, um, of residential housing. Uh, the last time they'd, the council had um, agreed to a rezoning was 1987. Um, so they, they weren't too keen on any new, new housing. Um, so, and so then right next door was Ingham, the Ingham's Jook factories, as I call them. They'd, they'd sold out to KKR uh, for about half a billion. KKR put all the stuff they wanted to continue, you know, uh, producing the, the chooks um, on, and they sold them on long-term leasebacks. So they got their half a billion back. So they've had a couple of things just discarding. So, and it's public, you know, I can, it's probably, you can go and look it up. I paid 3.3 million. I was the only bidder on it, you know, add a, add a couple of zeros to that now. And coincidentally, you know, now you'll probably get it as, you know, what's the hottest, parts of real estate at the moment. Well, it's residential and it's, it's industrial. And, and every Tom, Dick and Harry wants to have a little business in Byron Bay so they can go surfing in the morning <laughs> and get in late to their surfboard shop or their clothing shop or their, their restaurants are not opening because the, the surf's on at what he goes. Um, that's Byron, you know. Um, and they're not at the moment because it's just outrageously, you know, it's the hot spot tourism wise. What do I think about it? I, I think not just Byron, the whole area from, um, if you ask me, you know, if I was a young developer, the whole area from Coolangatta down to Lennox Head is in play. Um, and, and go in, inland, oh, I don't know, just jump in a car and go in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and you'll come across four or five different townships that where you'll buy it maybe five hundred thousand dollars for a little house, you know. <coughs> um, Mullumbimby, where the council have their offices, ten years ago you'd get three for three hundred thousand, you get a, a nice big Queenslander in the town. Um, today that's worth nine hundred to a million, so it's gone up three times, three hundred percent in that ten years. Ditto f from all those peripheral areas, uh, um, ocean shores, and these things. Um, it sat there for many, many years. Cornell and, and Hoag's, when they went up there 30 years ago, the story goes that he got a Channel 9 chopper to go and fly up and down the coast and said, tell me the best spot after Crocodile Dundee, Dundee 2. Well, they said um, there was Berry down the south coast and then there was here. And I said, why'd you take here? He said, because it was warmer. And, he, and, he's, and, he, you know, and he's not in the best of health, but he bought brilliantly. That was his, yeah, they were the first in. And, and they, they got a bit of, per, you know, bit of uh, notoriety in those days because hoax and, you know. Um, but this time it's, you know, and, and with the other thing this time is because every Tom, Dick and Harry from, from Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne wanted to do home uh, working, <laughs> right, for SOs or or, or uh, um, CBAs or something, you know. And all oh, right, I'll, I'll I'll just have mine from Byron Byron Bay. Thanks very much. That's it. They're every every inquiry, every second inquiry is for blokes who <laughs> want to move their family up, you know, and they're thirty five. There's not enough for them, so the, it's going through the bloody roof, and you you can't stop it. And then the other thing that's going to press on it is that you the, the the council is just you know not happy with pretty well what they've got you know so you know we it took us seven years to get that that um th that approval on the residential uh, diff different with industrial but seven years and that's it what will happen it's a bit like it's a you know the melbourneites right i was at, we were up in um uh, Noosa, just like last weekend, in this, exactly the same position. They've got Hastings Street, it's all sold out, you know, but 20 years ago. Restaurants are there, bit of waterways, that's it. You know, if you want to walk to the beach, it's done, brother, you know. Ditto here, you'll be, you know, um, there was a guy who just paid 18.6 million for a, a, pra a place right on what he goes, opposite Ray's, and uh, he, he's one of the owners of F45. 
and I had a chat with him recently, and, and he's a very rich, rich young man. Um, he's the type of bloke you're going to get there. Now, they're going to want better restaurants, better coffee shops, you know. Um, they're going to have, you know, better houses. So I always, you know, I always say, listen, has anyone been, you know, I was saying 10 years ago to the agent mates, you know, have you ever been to Santa Barbara? No. I said, well, that's what you're going to have here. Your hippies are gone and you're going to have a very, even your, your, your backpackers, they're going to go and you're going to have very wealthy people owning this stuff. And it's bang, you know, it will have three year run, then a rest, then again, then again, it'll just keep going. And you, the, all the perver, peripheral areas will go as well and all already are going, you know. Um, what they could do is go and, you know, and, and, and it's, a, it's a planning job to, for that whole area. I mean, it's probably, I don't know, 150 kilometres of it and then in Hinland. And it's beautiful, beautiful property. Um, but someone's got to rezone it and most councils aren't that happy about rezoning space. What about the Gold Coast? It's going on a, a similar sort of run at the moment. Any thoughts on the, the market there? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, I had I had a house there for 12 years and, and, and uh, you know, then you know, again, once again, you know, well, Max Christmas and all those guys. I think it's going down. You know, I think it's going backwards in terms of quality of, of assets and with what people want to... If, if, if you're going to build something, there's if, oh, two things. I was, only, I was only talking to an agent up there yesterday, and I said there are. It's finally the prices have got to so much as a square metre, like fifteen thousand a square metre. There's a couple of crackers been offering on the market from Burley Heads. They've got a beauty down there. There's another one at Palm Beach. Harry's up there, of course. You know, um, doing his things. You know, there's been. And there's been, in Sunland we're doing high 60 story things. There was no planning. So they've got trams up the bloody middle of it. I mean, you know, and they've, and they've got a very pro council, you know, he, he's, he's sort of, he's, he's your man to go to. But um, I think it's, you know, it's a jigsaw. You know, there's traffic everywhere. You know, when I was going there 12, let's call it 20 years ago, it was terrific. It's like a little country town, a bit like Byron. But there you had a pro and you could go up here. The, 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 the idea that, you know, if you want to invest, it will take Byron before you'd go to the Gold Coast every day of the week because you're not going to get any more. And then we know what, and there never will be a high rise in Byron Bay. Right. Every second day, the Chinese are going in there doing sixty stories. So, if you want, that's what you like. Good. It's not for me. One of your most well-known acquisitions was a property off the coast of Yapu, known as Great Keppel Island, which yeah. you mentioned earlier, wherein you had envisaged, envisaged uh, developing a luxury casino resort. Take us through how this acquisition came about, and and what were your plans for the project? Yeah. Well, you know, we've we'd been in Brisbane and doing really well for ourselves. Uh, like one of the first individual groups up there back in 2001. And um, so we're there for about four or five years. Wayne Gardner, the ex, the, the 500cc motorbike champion, um, says he's got a mate up in uh, Rocky, Rockhampton, that's got all these subdivisions. Well, will we go and have a look at them. I said, Wayne, and he's calling me from Monaco. And I said, mate, Piss off, I, we haven't got time. Anyway, I said, all right, to Anthony A.S. Who, who works for me as my CEO, I said, get on a plane and go and have a look at this stuff. So he goes up, looks at the subdivision, they're in the middle of nowhere with, nowhere, nowhere with um, a couple of chooks and, and, and cows on them. And he said, oh, well, hang on, the owners of Great Keppel will sell. So we went over and had a look at it. And he said, oh, you may want to have a look at this. They want 16 million. It used to be get wrecked and all that sort of thing. So, all right, I'll go up and have a look, because just for a bit of fun, you know. Yeah, well, 16 years later, <laughs> we, you know, I just had the idea that, you know, I've been lucky, you know, being wealthy from 30 onwards. You know, I've stayed in five-star places all over the world, and I thought, this is the island to do it. If you, number one, you, you need access, and there was big enough area to get you know, uh, an 80 to 100 person 
um, commercial jet to, to bring in your, your, your people, your, your, your guests. There was plenty of room for golf course, uh, a really good golf course, so we in, in, in engaged uh, Greg Norman. And on the, whole, uh, on the, um, the, 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 uh, the hotel, we thought, um, we spoke to Four Seasons, the number one chain in the world. Absolutely loved the idea and went up there, flew them up there. We, we walked all over it. Yep, you build it, we'll manage it, you know. So that was all good. But the problem is if you haven't got, you need to, if you're going to play that game of getting an island, even though we were lucky, it's only 12 Ks, unless there's some income coming in, the banks won't lend you a dollar on it. So uh, everything we did up there was with cash. That's why we still own it. So then I thought, okay, well, and it took me eight years to get a DA approved, you know, like lobbying every, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry minister, uh, including several trips to, um, uh, to, to, to Canberra, including one to Peter Garrett. What about if we get a casino, you know? So the, up, up at that stage, they were getting ready to um, do the, put, 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 up, put up for tender the one in Brisbane, which they eventually went, uh, Crown, Crown had a crack and then Star won it. They had two more licenses for regional areas. I thought we were, we've got to get this uh, without, you know, what did we do? Well, no, we didn't get it. <laughs> so, um, and that would then we would have had partners for sure for coming down from Asia, without doubt. We had plenty of Chinese look at it to do it themselves or in partnership. Just the the, the hotel and the and, and and bear in mind it was a. When we say it's a hotel and all that, yeah, it's there. But that's so you could sell the real estate. There were 460 rooms, uh, uh, houses approved around the golf course and then another 300 around with the apartments around the marina. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a doable deal um, from a property um, perspective in terms of, you know, apartments and, and, and houses. Take us through your best and worst deals. Okay, I've I haven't had a worse deal. I've virtually not lost on virtually virtually anything. I've had over the years. I've I've I've, I've ha I have hit and runs in Wollongong and South Coast, and have been very, really, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, profitable. Um, so one one or two I pulled out that I bought and thought, oh, I'm just too busy up here, so I I dump it, you know. But that's. If I could be bothered to continue, I would have done it. I haven't lost anything. anything. And the better the better ones would be obviously Nine Castle Ray. I paid 121 million for that, and that was a good one, um, a really good one. And but just before that, as I said, I bought a mortgage in possession, um, a Connell Street, a Connell House. It was where 50 years ago there was was the old stock exchange was in there. And uh, ex, you know, blue chip, you know, Collins Street type stuff, and, and we we made good, really good money on those two. Like from what I paid, fifty two, we walked away with more well, like about eighty five, four to ninety. Um, so that was that was small ones, but you know, the yeah, the 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 the, the North North Point and the Nine Castle Row both, you know, we we what we we had to sell. Um, uh, North Point, even though we'd, we'd almost uh, we'd put 50% into the income that we'd had when we bought it. Um, we were in the GFC at the tail end. Suncor lent us the money. They wanted to get involved with big hitters in Sydney. So when they when they came to roll it over after five years, I said, well, I'm not going to roll it over. Thank you very much. Oh, this is good. We went to the local banks and they were. They said, "Well, we'll lend you about sixty percent, right?" Well, we thought that's easy because we, our rent when we went in was sixteen million. We we took it up to twenty four million over five years net, and uh, we're only we our debt was about a hundred, so it was easily carry to carry it. Um, they weren't interested because their value of their um, um, their, their capitalised value on the stock market was less than what they're worth on the street. So they couldn't buy or sell anything for a while. There was just this funny little period, you know. We did sell it to Cromwell and it was, there was a nice fat profit in it. Um, but, you know, dicey, you know, it, you know, it, it, when, it, when, you, when you see these periods coming up, you know, um, 
you know, it's it, it, you, you want to you want to be move quickly before it gets there. You know what I mean? If you've got a, stuff with, um, you know, just raw land, if you can get rid of it before it gets out, that this is not the time to be able to sitting on raw land, then then get out and do it and have a, have a, have a you know a, enough sitting around to cruise through it, which is pretty well. You know, the three or four I've been through before that, it was never a problem. You know, I mean, you can, quite often you mean, you just, and the great thing about, you know, my business is, is, is that I've, I carry basically no staff. So if I've got to say, listen, boys, look after, manage the properties we've got, and I'm, I'm going over to Europe for six months, and I'll see you, see you, I'll see you when all this is over. <laughs> um, you can do it, you know. You can't do that if you're you're, you're running um, Stocklands or something, you know, or Mervac. So, um, and that's why I've kept. I've never gone public, you know, because it's 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 uh, not my lifestyle. Just on that, what are the most common mistakes that uh, new developers or inexperienced developers make? Do you think? Okay, well, so what 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 you're saying is this: that at the moment, they've got. We're talking two two percent finance rates. Never had it. Never even thought it would come within cooey of it. I remember twenty five years ago having a bet with some guys at the, at one of the restaurants uh, at um, at uh, in the city. You know, hundred bucks. You know, it'll never make seven percent. You know, yes, it will. Yes, it will. No, it won't. You know, yeah, it 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 didn't. <laughs> and um, I forget whether I won or lost, but so. That was when we were paying 10%. I mean, 2% is just, that is a massive change. Massive change, you know, and it's the underlying strength right across Australia, whether you're, at, you know, like Dubbo's on a run, um, uh, you know, all those peripheral towns. There's a bunch of them internally, you know, Tamworth and that. They'll be having a nice little run at, uh, on their houses at the moment because people are moving out thinking we're going to work from home. You know, um, on the, in the towards the city, so that's that's huge. That's huge, and um, the you know, as long as you you know, there's, and there's so so whether it's Melbourne, Brisbane, or Sydney, Sydney predominantly, you know, they're going to have a we're going to have a run like we've never seen before. This this is huge, and it's um, it's the biggest influence on the market at the moment from pre. Prim primarily um, residential, um, you know, the auctions on the on last Saturday in, in Sydney um, reached ninety percent sales, and most um, uh, properties were going over a hundred thousand dollars above their reserve. We've never seen that before, and and if you think about it, the guys that were sitting on a two million dollar house and they want to want to get to three million, that, that extra million at two percent, that's that's 400 bucks a week. I think you can, you know, you can afford that, you know. So they're at an auction, so they go again, go again, go again. A tough time for first home buyers. Um, you know, people even want to crank it up a bit from two to four million. Yes, you could, you can do it, but you, you, you game at an auction to keep putting your hand up. <laughs> and most people, it's a, the ner most nervous thing they'll ever do in their life is go to a, a property auction. Well, I've been to a couple of thousand. 